Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and my, all my friends. How are you guys doing tonight? Uh, it's great to be with you here Saturday evening or afternoon. Uh, the background is very well uh, decorated today. Uh, we have so many new friends, so many new followers and subscribers to the channel. So I thought, hey, maybe I'll bring out more of the Dakimakras for the for the newbies. So um, yeah, a lot's happened. So apparently like people are saying there's some interview. I don't know what's going on. I don't know why. I just got a bunch of new subscribers and people are telling me not to do interviews to do interviews. I don't know what you're talking about, frankly. Frankly, I'm not sure what's going on. All I know is that there was supposed to be a really big interview today. It was supposed to be with Classical Theist. We love Classical Theist. He was supposed to come on uh, to do an interview with me about Divine Simplicity. He wasn't able to. He's not feeling well. Pray for his health. But he said he should be able to Monday. So Classical Theist will be on the channel Monday. That's the only interview I know about so far. All right. So I don't know what interviews you guys are talking about in the comment section and in the live chat. No idea what you're talking about. All I know is that Classical Theist, he's coming on and that's going to be a big interview. Um, so for the people who are new, the way this channel works is that I usually uh, stream about something serious and then afterwards I end the recording and then we have a little bit of a time to just be cozy, to talk, to be very um, uh, casual. Uh, so we have a very casual conversations and that part is usually cut out. So that's why you probably don't you find clips on it on the internet and what have you, but you won't find it, uh, on my channel very often. Uh, and a lot of that stuff that maybe you'll find clips on for whatever reason, you might find clips on of me. A lot of that stuff is like really old too. It's like years old by the way. So just remember that, just keep that in mind. All right. Um, but here is the entropy link uh, if you would like to patron uh, my uh, my content. If you want to support me, there's a great way to do so. And you can also ask me questions uh, so that way I don't miss them. I'm looking at the live chat. Uh, usually I pr stay pretty focused during the monologue on what I'm talking about. And then I'll look at uh, whatever you guys are talking about afterwards. So with that out of the way, uh, let's get back into the subject we were uh, discussing last time, which is dogmatic progression. So um, for the new people, this is a very Catholic oriented channel, despite what many people might tell you. We do like anime. We do like talking about anime uh, and having conversations about that. But the main thrust of it and everything comes back to uh, our faith. And so that's what, you know, that's what I specialize in is theology and um philosophy. Uh, and so that's what I talk about. Uh, and so the last uh, show, which was very long and somewhat, some people said it was a little too intellectual. So I'll try to uh, keep it a little shorter today. It was on the progression of dogma. Uh, and so we established in the last show that dogmatic progression is real to some degree. To some degree, you have to acknowledge that dogma has progressed beyond the first century. The language that we used in like the fifth century uh, or in the Council of Chalcedon is not going to be the same language you see at the very beginning of the church. You're not going to see that in the Apostles' Creed. Uh, and this is why we've developed other creeds like the Nicene Creed. Uh, and I gave that in the last video. Uh, and that's something that has to be recognized whether you're Protestant, Orthodox, uh, or Catholic. Um, and so now I'm going to begin transitioning to talk about the genuine nature of progression uh, and how basically it works, how it operates, the operative principles. Uh, afterwards, I'll establish a criteria uh, for genuine, like to basically uh, decide whether or not some progression is genuine, whether or not it's organic uh, progression and whether or not it's legitimate. So that'll be probably the next video after this one. And then finally, we'll have a video about um, whether we can apply those tests to things like the papacy. Uh, of course, things like the papacy or purgatory are often derided by Protestants and Orthodox as innovations, as accretions, as things that were just invented in the Middle Ages, or at least uh, like wildly uh, misstrewed in the Middle Ages or something like that um, for whatever reason. And so uh, they should be rejected. They're not sound progression. There's not sound progression there. So that's what I'm trying to respond against. All right. Um, so that's kind of an overall context to this monologue. 
And just for a reminder, uh, dogmatic progression is not like evolution. We're not talking about evolution here in this very modernist idea. We're not adding anything new whatsoever. Uh, so far as the truth uh, itself is concerned, that is, they say, the truth in which that is being revealed, there's nothing new being revealed uh, to Revelation. Uh, to say, for example, and this is an example we kind of talked about last time, that the Father and the Son are consubstantial with each other, that doesn't add one iota to the revealed truth that the Father and the Son are just one thing. And so you see in the first century, people say the Father and the Son are one thing. Later on in Nicaea, they say they're consubstantial with each other. Uh, we're just simply expressing in more precise terminology. Uh, so tonight, the question I really want to focus on is, in what does uh, that progression, that dogmatic progression, consist of? And there's three things it consists of. The first is in a more finished exposition of dogmas, the basically the gist of which has always been taught explicitly. Uh, and so we have explicit dogmas, uh, and we, basically we want to finish them off. We want to have a more finished, more complete exposition of those. The second, uh, the second part is the explicit proposal of dogmas which have been formally taught uh, implicitly in other dogmas. So there might be something that is formally taught in another dogma and contained within that there are certain implicit dogmas that are brought to light later on. And then third, in clear, the church in the uh, clear cut proposal of dogmas uh, which were formally uh, proposed in less obvious fashion. And so they might have been proposed but in kind of an obscure sense or perhaps they were proposed uh, through practice or through um, custom rather than just like a fiat by the church. So to begin with the first part, uh, the first, uh, again, the question is, in what does the progress consist in? It's consistent in the first answer to that is in the most, uh, the more finished exposition of dogmas, the gist of which has always been taught explicitly. Uh, and so at the beginning of the church, there were many uh, dogmas that were taught uh, explicitly, but in like a popular language, you, you could say, and therefore in a sense vaguely. Uh, and for example, the church has always professed the one belief uh, that God, who is the Father, uh, he is the Son, and he is the Holy Ghost. They professed always this monotheism while maintaining the Trinity. But the scientific and philosophical terminology that would express this dogma more brilliantly and more accurately and with more um, uh, with more clarity came on later, like I said, at Nicaea. Terminology such as consubstantial, perichoresis, uh, etc. came on the scene, uh, as well as at Chalcedon and Ephesus and many of the early church councils. And this is something that all Christians, Protestants, Catholics, and Orthodox can agree on. Um, and St. Vincent of Larins, he says this very nicely, and I, I bring up this guy a lot, St. Vincent, of, to, in this show, St. Vincent of Larins, he was a French uh, monk in the 5th century, writing in the 5th century, I believe, um, and it's because there's often this uh, conception that dogmatic progression was established by Cardinal Henry Newman, now St. Cardinal Henry Newman, as a way to basically um, prove Catholicism after it came out that uh, the Catholic Church didn't have quite the strong claim as they wanted to on the historicity of the papacy or something like that. So they invented the idea of uh, dogmatic progression. Uh, and that's what he Cardinal John Henry Newman did. And that's not true. The idea of dogmatic progression has existed since the very early church, and by this, you know, the saint, Saint Vincent of Larins, this monk in the fifth century. Uh, he's also the, the saint uh, who came up with the phrase that that which is Catholic is taught everywhere by everyone at all times, uh, or the universal and ordinary magisterium of the church. That's something that originated with him. Uh, and so here's a quote basically expressing what I just explained. Quote, O oh, doctor, if a divine gift has fitted you out for the task, carve out the precious gem of the divine dogma. By your exposition, may that be understood more lucidly, which formerly was more dimly believed. Through you may posterity bless as understood what antiquity venerated, though not understood. In other words, posterity, those people who come after you, that they may uh, bless as being able to bless, uh, you know, these councils in the church for making more lucid and more explicit so that they can understand better a fuller and a rounder exposition of a dogma that had always been 
uh, understood in a sense, but in a more vague way. Um, and he continues the quote saying, but teach the very same truths which you have learned so that when you say something in a new way, you do not say something altogether new. And the end quote. And that's the heart of what progression looks like. It's not that we're saying something um, that's altogether new. It's just that we're saying it in a new way or in in this part, what does dogmatic cons progression consist of? It's this fuller exposition of something already taught. Now, part uh, the second part of uh, what does uh, dogmatic progression consist in is the explicit proposal of dogmas, which had been formally taught implicitly in other dogmas. All right. So the church has often proposed things which had been uh, implied in previous uh, dogmas, either by articulating individually the various elements of a complex dogma. So you might have a complex dogma that has very multifaceted. And so they begin to examine all the various facets and make those like and that are implicit therein and make those explicit. Uh, or by stating uh, in various particular propositions, uh, which she has formally included under kind of a universal proposition. And so there might be some more broad proposition, and I'll give examples, more broad proposition that the church has offered. And then um, use these particular uh, propositions that the church has kind of derived from that or have kind of fallen under that universal proposition that the church has gathered or the church has proposed for us for belief. Uh, and for example, the church taught that Christ is true God and true man. You see this at the very beginning of the church, always taught that God, uh, that Christ, that Jesus Christ, the incarnate God, he is true God and he's true man. And so then you can dissect this very complicated dogma into various constitutive, constitutive elements uh, in you. That is why the church like began to say that Christ has two wills. They denied monothelitism. He has two natures that are fully present, denied monophysitism, uh, and they're entirely and fully present. And so this idea that God he is true God and true man had all these implications that were not there explicitly, but rather implicitly, and later the church made them explicit. So that's part of what dogmatic progression consists in, and that's what all Christians who are orthodox, by orthodox or the lower case O, uh, that is to say they have right faith, believe, whether they're Protestants, Catholics, or Eastern Orthodox. Uh, and then now here's an example that would apply to now just the Catholics and Orthodox. The church since the first century, probably, uh, yes, because it is contained in the Gospel of Luke, uh, it taught that the Blessed Virgin Mary was full of grace. Uh, and you can see even in the writings of the Church Fathers that the Virgin Mary was this typology for the Ark of the Covenant. You see this in not like in the very early on in the Church. And so you can unravel this multifaceted uh, proposition that she is the Ark, the new Ark of the Covenant. And you can come out with ideas that she is vir perpetually a virgin, that she lived a sinless life, she was conceived. Uh, without sin, uh, without original sin, and she never sinned once in her entire existence on earth. Um, and she was assumed into heaven. These things can kind of fall under this universal proposition that she was full of grace, as well as this, uh, this very complicated idea uh, that she used this typology for the Ark of the Covenant. And so we see here this unraveling of this great mystery in the church. And that is why it took the church quite a long time to formally, though this had been believed for a long time, declare that Mary was conceived without original sin by Pius IX in the 1800s. But then before, even before then, people had begun to understand that. Uh, but it existed in a seed form at the very beginning of the church. Uh, another example, and this, so that example applies to the Orthodox and Catholics both agree there. Uh, for the most part, I would say. Perhaps you could argue that they don't believe in that Mary was conceived without original sin, but a lot of that has to do with just uh, terminology and differences in language. Uh, and then the and third example I have, and this example really only applies to Catholics. And so I'd be curious to see how uh, a Protestant or an Orthodox can differentiate these three when they seem to me to be the exact same kind of dogmatic progression. The church has taught that Peter was the foundation of the church. He was the rock, as Christ says, on which the church is built. There was church fathers that definitely said things to that effect. Uh, obviously, you'll find church fathers that We'll say Christ is the rock where that all the apostles are the rock as well. And that symbolism is also valid. But you will see they say Peter was the rock um, and he was the shepherd of all sheep. Christ says that he is the uh, that he is going to lead the flock. 
he says, Peter, lead my sheep. Uh, after he says, like, Peter, do you love me? And he says, of course I do, Lord. And he says, then lead my sheep. Uh, so we see this being taught from Jesus. We see this being taught from uh, early church fathers, Leo the Great. Uh, and I'll do maybe a whole stream just defending that position. Uh, and so it comes naturally from this, the very particular rights and privileges of the Supreme Pontiff. So you have this kind of like more universal proposition that Peter's the foundation of the church. Um, he is, you know, this principal figure of the church. And then from that comes these particular propositions of his different rights and privileges. And again, it's a very complicated like mystery of like the, the various rights and privileges uh, of these ecclesiastical authorities that begins to develop over time. And we'll talk about the occasion for why this development uh, takes place. Um, and so as so long as the consequent is true, it seems to me that the antecedent necessarily follows and that this is legitimate. So for as so long as uh, someone can uphold that Peter is the foundation of the church and that's been taught from the very beginning, then the antecedent very naturally follows the very particular rights, uh, his universal and immediate jurisdiction, um, his ability for canonizations, his involvement in choosing bishops, things like that. Uh, and again, Saint Vincent of Lorenz, uh, I hope I say that name. It's a French, it's a French, uh, I believe, town. So uh, it might be Lero, I heard I some other people say, but uh, he uh, basically reiterates what I'm saying in a more uh, an articulate fashion, saying, quote, May the religion of souls imitate the process of bodies, which even though over the course of years, they may evolve and extend their members, still remain the same bodies which were there, which they were before. They are just the same number of joints and little children as in grown men, and if in their place arise those members which appear at a, a, a mature age, like maybe your wisdom teeth, um, they were accounted for in the power of the seed, in other words, like your DNA or your the frame of your humanity, so that nothing new is afterwards brought to maturity in old men, which was not already priorly present, though hidden. So too is it fitting the dogma of the Christian religion should follow the laws of progress, so that with the years it may be consolidated and broadened with time and made more noble with age, and it remain still uncorrupted and undefiled. End quote. And so we see here St. Vincent is this, this beautiful analogy of like a baby and how he is immature, but he has every component part, all the component essential parts of humanity are contained within him, uh, at least implicitly or in a seed form. And then as the child begins to grow and mature, he begins to, you know, he has wisdom teeth now or those parts which he always had begins to grow larger. Um... And begins to fully develop and take on the mantle of adulthood. And the church likewise has to do the same thing as she's confronted with new um, heresies and what have you. And we'll, again, we'll talk about the different occasions for dogmatic progression in the next video. So that's the second um, concept of what does dogmatic progression uh, consist of. And then the third and final element of what does dogmatic consist progression consistum consist of it is the clear-cut proposal of dogmas which were formally uh proposed in maybe perhaps a less uh obvious fashion like such as a custom uh, liturgy praxis praxis I mean like a praxis the practice of the church uh and etc and so for example from the earliest times we see that infants are being baptized uh and but later on it would become explicit dogma uh, of the church that baptism is a regenerative process. It is the new act of uh, circumcision and therefore uh, it's something that we should and it's something that brings us into a covenantal community with the church and with God and therefore it should be applied to infants. So we see this practice of the church uh, baptizing infants since the very beginning but later on like we begin to explicitly define you know what is baptism. Uh, another example would be like the customs surrounding the Eucharist and the Mass. They were always there. The liturgy was there at the very beginning, but it was kind of hidden and concealed beneath uh, liturgical rules and uh, prayers. Uh, and it would take years for like things like the true presence to become a dogma of the church. Uh, and so, but we see that even in these prayers and even in the, the veneration of the Eucharist and things like this, uh, the way that... Um, uh, the church wanted to conceal these things. Uh, they didn't allow, for example, even catechumens. Catechumens were 
Christians who wanted, or people who wanted to become Christians, they were on the process of becoming Christians, um, and they were on their way. They were not even allowed to be there at the consecration. And so we see these kind of practices that would suggest, uh, and we see things from St. Paul, for example, where he says that if you take the Eucharist unworthily, you drink the judgment of God to yourself. And then we see these practices, and then later on, it becomes more explicit dogma that this is the true presence that is being um, that is being basically spoken of in a in a less uh, in, in, without using words basically, uh, and then this is where I would say papal infall infallibility applies. Uh, papal infallibility I think is contained in this category, uh, and because while it is true that until like the Middle Ages the words to express papal infallibility and more generally infallibility were not like ex explicitly there. However, if you look at the practice. Uh, of the early church. Uh, it was implied basically that the authority of the Pope uh, was very supreme. There is a certain sense of um, the weight of his teachings, the respect of his authority. You look at the practice of the church, the way they respected the Pope's um, his, uh, jurisdiction, things like this. Um, and you can look at things like St. Leo's Tome, and I'll go into that again in another video. Uh, if you look at this, you can see that there was a certain respect that was given uniquely to his authority. And so while the church may not have spoken in words and says, said like, oh, the Pope has, uh, you know, he can speak and foul on his own terms, but rather it was more through prax practice, praxis or practice in which the church recognized the Pope's, you know, had a very unique authority. Uh, and it was through that respect to that authority that that was implied therein. Uh, and again, St. Vincent, of course, he writes on this as well. None of these ideas are fresh and new. I didn't come up with them. They've existed since the very beginning. You know, these ideas of progression existed from earlier times in the church. He writes, quote, Finally, what else has the church ever struggled to do by the decrees of her councils, except to see that the very same thing she taught earlier in more casual fashion should now be taught more insistently, that the very same thing she reverenced in earlier days more quietly should afterwards be venerated with much more care. End quote. All right, in other words, basically, those things which had been taught in a casual fashion or it had been basically spoken of without using words, but through custom and through uh, deed would now be made uh, explicit, would now be, we can now put pen to paper to describe what is going on here. Uh, so to just summarize, the question that we wanted to answer was what does dogmatic progression consist in? And it consists in three things, the finished exposition of the popular, the explicit of the implicit, and the theoretical teaching of what was held by custom and by other deeds of the church. So now hopefully you have a better understanding going forward of uh, what progression, dogmatic progression genuinely consists in. And we'll continue on this topic hopefully in the next video. So look forward for that.